And let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. As with uh, Monday and Tuesday, I probably have too much stuff packed into this hour. Um, but we'll we'll deal with it again. So uh, again, this is part of this whole uh, series of Moodle basics kinds of workshops this week. Um, we're kind of mirroring what's been going on with the SUNY Remote Teaching Institute and some of their webinar sessions on Blackboard. So I wanted to have a parallel track for uh, Moodle. So I would not necessarily have uh, broken up the workshops over this week in this way um, because uh, there's way too much we can talk about for learning activities to fit into one session, but that's where we are. Monday was kind of an orientation in Moodle for really for faculty who've never used it before. Yesterday we talked about getting content in various forms into your Moodle course. Today we're gonna talk about um, some of the main learning activities that you might consider using in your Moodle courses this fall, especially as as many of us are um, still going to be uh, teaching remote in, in instruction courses, or in my case, I'm actually going to have a fully designed online course. Obviously, it's going to be more important to think about how to incorporate various learning activities into our Moodle courses in ways that maybe uh, we haven't in the past if we've just focused on face-to-face -face classes. Tomorrow, I'll talk a little bit about assessments and gradebook and then wrap it all off with some course administration tools and some other kinds of of, of tools that um, in Moodle that faculty may not be aware of that can help our students be a little bit more successful. Uh, mostly gonna focus on collecting assignments, holding discussions and testing today. Uh, and we'll see uh, if we can get through that much in the time we've got available. I do wanna start off though, just by pointing out that, um, you know, there are a variety of other learning activities. We talked about VoiceThread yesterday as a way for you to put content in your into your Moodle courses, but you can also set up VoiceThread activities that are assignments where the students are actually either commenting on VoiceThreads or creating their own VoiceThreads to share. And there's a whole separate VoiceThreads assignment um, track. Um, we've got the H5P interactive activities, uh, which can be, many of them are actually, um, well, they're all learning activities, but many of them are also set up to be graded assignments. Uh, a couple of other native uh, Moodle activities, the wiki activity can be good for if you're wanting to uh, assign group work in your Moodle course and your course is meeting remotely this fall. Workshop activity is a way to provide structured peer review. It's kind of like a, an assignment activity in that students can submit their work to the workshop activity, but then the workshop activity provides a way for um, you to parcel out Okay, I want each student's paper to be reviewed by three other students. So Moodle randomly take you know every student's submission and randomly assign them to three others. And oh, by the way, here's the, the grading criteria or the rubric that I want students to use to provide feedback. So uh, workshop activity is also something probably worth its own workshop, uh, its own workshop uh, sometime this summer. We also have a separate portfolio system, our Mahara e-portfolio e system. And uh, you know, part of the way to kind of put together a capstone experience for your students is uh, to have them develop a course portfolio. And then we have an activity, we have an integration in Moodle where you can have students submit their portfolios from Mahara to your Moodle course so that you can provide assessments and grading and so forth. Um, again, this is tied to the, oh, and, and now that uh, hopefully most people are in, we are up to 23, go ahead and just uh, pop your name in the chat and, and talk a little bit about what you are, have already done with uh, 
adding um, learning activities to your Moodle courses. Uh, I won't be concentrating much on the chat during the workshop today, but I do save them and we will go through them and get back to people individually on questions if there are questions that Marie hasn't already um, dealt with as we go through the session because she's monitoring the chat for us. Uh, again, this is tied a little bit to the Moodle Foundations course. Um, I think most of you, I've got most of you in here um, from the uh, workshops on Monday and Tuesday. If you haven't, weren't signed up for one of those, I was too busy this afternoon with the SUNY conference to get you in. I will make sure everyone who's in the who signed up for the workshop this afternoon is, is in this. Again, this is a self-paced course. Uh, it's got um, uh, screencasts and descriptive materials uh, relevant to these different areas, as well as links out to our various Moodle guides. For the foundation certificate, I don't go into the, uh, the form activity, the assignment activity, or the quiz activity in depth, but I just have uh, kind of a basic um, overview that you can come in here and um, we'll, we'll send around, I'll send around some um, reminders to tie this into uh, follow up for the workshop. So what I want to do is really kind of go through at a high level what's involved in adding assignment activities. Um, I think it's worth talking about Turnitin activities. The forum activity is uh, obviously will be useful for replacing the um, course discussions that we're not having in our face-to-face -face classes this fall as well as some other uses we'll talk about and finish off with the quiz activity. Okay. So uh, given uh, the time involved, let me just uh, jump right in. I thought I would start with, with assignments. First of all, I mean, many of you may already have been using assignments in your Moodle courses for your face-to-face courses in the past. It's a good way for you to have students turn in uh, assignments, but not everyone on the on the call this afternoon has used them. So uh, I mean, base, certainly you can use the assignment activity for any any way that you would, you know, collect assignments in your courses in the past. These could be these could be major assignments, but if you're in the habit of for example, um, assigning uh, reading response papers, like a one page or one and a half page uh, reading response paper uh, to ensure that students are doing the, the reading before you get together uh, in a given week. Uh, you can set that up as a Moodle assignment activity, obviously. You can do this whether you're teaching face-to-face -face or remotely. Uh, you can have it due, you know, a day or two before your scheduled class time. And I know a lot of faculty <clears throat> will do uh, response papers, have students bring the response papers into the class uh, when they're meeting face to face. It's kind of their uh, entry ticket in. The limitation there, I mean, there's some benefits because students will have it, they can mark them up and so forth. But that approach doesn't let you see what the students know and don't know ahead of time. So you could set up this assignment to, you know, be due a, a day or two before the class. It gives you time to get in and scan what uh, reading responses, reading reflections your students have been submitting, and will give you an idea about, um, uh, you know, how, how the students are doing before you get into your Zoom session or before, if you are teaching face-to-face, -face, how your students are doing before they uh, come into the classroom. So I'll give you a warning. Today's session is going to be more nuts and bolts. So I want to go through just the steps needed to um, set up an assignment. 
And uh, so I'm in my sandbox course and we'll just be using my sandbox, I'll just be using my sandbox course today. I'm not really gonna be flipping around from one course to another. I'll show you the steps for setting up the activity. I've got uh, students, uh, I'm logged in as students in a couple of other browsers and you know, if there are things to show how it looks to students, we can do that as well. So um, it's pretty straightforward to add an assignment. In fact, assignments at the top of the list here in the activities chooser and click add. Um, you could basically just give an assignment name and not deal with many of these other um, uh settings but it's worth looking over here um you can obviously or you would want to provide here's what you need to do in the description of the assignment if you are um, wanting to provide um an excel spreadsheet for example that they download and fill in or maybe this is a um, a major paper and you want to give them an example of what a, pa a good paper looks like you can attach uh, files that you've uploaded to the assignment um, assignments basically open up to allow submissions at a particular time they are due at a particular time you can decide whether or not you want to set a cutoff date Okay, so this particular, um, and the default is basically for the submissions to start pretty much when you create the uh, um, assignment activity and close a week later. That's likely not the dates that you want. So if we can say, no, I want this to open up to the students to be able to submit their papers next Monday. And then um, it's going to be due on July 8th. Due just means that any paper that's submitted after that will be marked with a red stamp, timestamp by Moodle saying, you know, this came in on July 10th, two days late. Does not, due date by itself does not prevent students from submitting an assignment. If you want, students not to be able to submit after a particular date, you can enable the cutoff date. And, um, you know, it's due on the, what did I say? It's due on July 8th. So maybe, you know, by a week later, I don't want to see them anymore. Um, I tend not to enable the cutoff date because this, turns the assignment into a place where students can't submit the paper. And then I got a lot of emails. You know, I was two minutes late before the cutoff and now I can't, especially if you set the cutoff to be the same as the due date, um, then um, I, I find it easier just to allow students to submit things late, let Moodle let me know how late they are and decide what that means. If it is so late that I'm not gonna grade it and, and I've made that clear to the students, then I don't bother setting a cutoff date, but you can if you want. There's also this remind to grade me by if you want Moodle to nag you to, um, you know, say, you know, make sure that you remember to go back in and grade by. That's enabled by default. I know a lot of faculty, um, find it annoying and so they turn it off. You can have st uh, students upload files uh, or you know document files or you can have them do online text. If your assignment is just I want to give them I want to give all my students a quick some quick reflection prompts to have them um, discuss or think about some uh, aspects of the reading. Rather than have them having them write that up in a Word document, or maybe they write it up in Apple uh, Pages or uh, you know a PDF or whatever, um, 
if you just do online text, then they would just type their reflections right into the assignment in Moodle, and then you would just view them right there in Moodle. Um, the default is for file submissions, and um, oftentimes that's what, um, what faculty are wanting. You can control how many files you want students to submit. Most of the time, uh, faculty would just want the students to submit the one file. But maybe you're wanting to do not a portfolio in the portfolio system, but just kind of a pseudo portfolio in Moodle. Uh, you could say, you know, upload your five best uh, writing samples as files and use the online text field to reflect on why you selected those five uh, writing samples. That's, my, well, that's one reason why you might want to have students upload more than one file. You can also choose what file types you're going to accept. And there's a whole long list here. Um, so if you want um, to ensure that the only thing students are submitting to this assignment are PDF documents, you could expand that document files section, select PDF, and click Save Changes. And now the students have to upload a PDF. They can't upload an Excel file. They can't upload a JPEG. It's got to be a PDF. And we'll talk about why that, why you might want to do that in a minute. Um, come down here to grade. Uh, the default is, um, you know, how many points you're going to grade this out of. The default is 100. Maybe for this paper, I want to grade it out of 20 points. I can change that. The default is simple direct grading, and that's all I'm going to talk about today. But tomorrow, I'm going to talk about uh, rubrics and grading sheets and how those can be used with your uh, assignments to, um, to uh, incorporate some of those uh, rubric elements into your, into your grading. Um, you can specify whether Moodle is going to notify you. Um, you might want to select for Moodle to let you know when someone has submitted a paper late. Because if this is due on the 8th, I presumably would go in on the 8th and read through and grade the submissions that are there. But if I haven't set a cutoff date, I might want to know that four days later, Susan finally put uh, a paper up into the assignment. Um, and then in terms of feedback types, the default is for you to just be able to write feedback comments in the grading interface that uh, we'll look at in a minute. There are tools for you to actually uh, provide comments on PDFs that you can turn on, which is why you might want to restrict the file submissions to PDFs. And we'll look and see what that looks like with and without that on. If you um, are having students submit Word documents and you're wanting to download those Word documents and use Word's commenting tools to provide feedback. You can select this option for feedback files and that will give you a, a place where you could um, uh, upload that, that file that you've commented on back into the Moodle assignment so that the students would see your commented paper. Um, and I'm just going to hit, go ahead and click save and return to course. Oh, we're still having that issue. Don't unselect. Uh, we'll have to get CTS to look into this. Don't unselect that remind to grade by. So I just do the same thing. Workshop assignments example. 
yada, yada, yada. Just leave those as the defaults. I'm going to do a file submission. I'll do, I'll select these two feedback types and click uh, save and display. And you'll see here's your view of this uh, assignment. If you go back out to the front page of your Moodle course, you'll see the assignment's been added there. If I go over to um, to view the course, it's down here where I can actually see things. As a student, I will see that workshop and uh, Moodle will tell me, you know, here's the title, here are the directions. I have not submitted an attempt yet. I would have a button for adding my submission. I could just uh, drag and drop my file onto the, I should have picked a smaller file, uh, onto the file upload space because this is a file submission assignment. And as a student, I will see that that's there. I click Save Changes. I get um, I get clearly displayed to me that my file is there. It's been submitted. Now the assignment hasn't closed, so I could I could edit it. But let's uh, go back and assume that um, you know the assignment's due. I can come in here as uh, the instructor click on the assignment again, and I can see there is one uh, submission from my 18 students, and that one submission needs grading. Personally, I would just go in and click view all submissions to get a listing here. And you can see, I can see all of the students. Uh, I can see the the submitted for grading. I could look at it here, but that's not where I want to look at it. Uh, down here at the bottom, there are some various filters. Uh, so, you know, I can determine how many assignments I want to see per page. Hopefully not many of us have classes that are over 100. I've got 60 for my class this fall. Uh, I could say which of the submissions that require grading and select that filter and Moodle will collapse that list just down to the one or two or however many that I haven't that have been submitted that I haven't graded yet. Um, so if I click grade I will see the grading interface. Um, the default grading interface is this part right here where you can see uh, details about the submission. You have a link to download the file. You have a place to provide a, 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 nu a numeric grade out of 100 because I left it at, a, as a, at 100 points. Because I left the default feedback comments listed. I've got a place I can put in narrative feedback. This will show up to the student in the assignment, but also in the gradebook. Um, you know, I'll give the student a 50 out of 100 here because this is clearly a plagiarized paper. It's a website that they submitted. Uh, because this was submitted as a PDF and because I uh, turned on annotate PDF, I can actually view the PDF in the Moodle grading interface and use all of these tools here. I can put on comments, I can mark up the paper, I can use various stamps um, to provide feedback on, on the paper. The other thing, because I selected the option to be able to upload commented files, let's say, you know, I weren't doing this PDF um, commenting, but instead I was um, having students upload Word documents and I was downloading those Word documents. And then I wanted to return test Landa's Word document to, to them with all of my comments. I would just upload that here. Um, 
and I'm kind of running out of screen real estate here. I've got too many windows open, but uh, you get the point. I could just drag and drop that there. And um, by default, unless you change that, uh, Moodle is set up to notify each student when you do some grading. I'm going to actually turn that off because I you know, don't need to send out an email to my Gmail account for this. You can click save changes or you can click save and show next. That's a nice easy way to kind of cycle through the assignments. Uh, if I click save changes, as an instructor, I get feedback. I can see that the current grade in the feedback is 50. If I looked in the grade book, which we'll look at tomorrow, I would see a grade of 50 out of 100 for this assignment for that student. So that is a real high level overview of um, using the assignment act activity. Uh, Marie, any questions that we need to deal with? Uh, just some stuff about, does it depend on the max number of uploaded files in terms of resubmitting? I think there are some questions about, yeah, you know, yeah cutoff date and how that factors in and uh, due date stuff like that yeah uh, though there are some additional um, settings we didn't go through in detail you can determine whether or not students can resubmit um, in this case the due date hadn't arrived so the student got the message that they could resubmit um, but you could uh, turn that off um, So again, if we look at, if we just expand all the settings here on this assignment, you have the option to, um, I, I don't actually there may not be an option to turn off uh, resubmitting if the assignment is still open that is not not due yet. Um, attempts reopened. So uh, I guess this would be here. Um, well, actually, this is your option to reopen the assignment for a particular student. Um, so, yeah, um, you know, until the, the assignment is due, um, Moodle is going to tell the students that they could, uh, you know, resubmit because the assignment's not due yet. So you probably don't want to do a lot of grading and feedback on the submissions until it's actually the due date. Um, I think I will uh, not go into Turnitin in detail. Um, just a couple of comments about Turnitin assignments. We have this integration with Turnitin. Uh, you'll want to, this Turnitin assignment without the two after it is um, a kind of a, a relic from earlier semesters. We, the only reason we have it still turned on is that faculty may have used to turn it in one assignment type, you know, two, two years ago and want to go back and look at that in their course. You're going to want to add a turn it in assignment two. If you click add, Uh, with the setting up of the Turnitin assignment, um, again, you've got the ability to determine, you know, what grades and so forth. Um, you actually do have the ability to have students submit multiple parts to a Turnitin assignment. I've never found that to be um, useful. If I'm going to have students submit a draft and a final paper or a, an intro section, uh, a result section, and a conclusion section, I would probably set that up as three separate Turnitin assignments just to make it clearer. But each part is going to have a, uh, a, a date when they can when students can start start submitting a date when they are due 
and this post date is when grades that you have uh, assigned to the papers are, are released to the Moodle gradebook. So if you had a post date of July 10th, for example, and student papers were submitted on um, the first and over the next couple of days, which would be the weekend. So later that next week, you graded all of those papers. Those grades would not be shipped to the Moodle gradebook until after this post date. And so that has raised some questions in the past, you know, students uh, un not understanding why they can't see their grades in the gradebook because the post date hasn't occurred yet. As the instructor, you'll see these items in the gradebook grayed out until the post date comes. Um, Turnitin gives you both uh, originality report, which is useful for uh, you know checking uh, whether students are using non-original material, and you can interpret that um, however you want. Won't go through all of these in detail, but basically, the um, do you want the submitted papers to be checked against the Turnitin database of student papers, checked against the internet, checked against journals. You know, these are all set yes by default. Um, we find probably as many faculty use Turnitin for the grade mark options, which allows you to um, use the Turnitin interface to provide the same kind of, uh, you know, markup that uh, we talked about with the PDF annotate. Uh, you can turn on some automated grading of uh, grammar and not grading, but rating of grammar. Um, so, uh, you know, we're hopefully dealing with college students. So we want them to be able to spell and use grammar and maybe usage at the level of college students. And uh, if uh, these tools will automatically go through and highlight, you know, spelling issues or, or grammar issues in papers that are submitted. You click save and display. Then um, what you would see is your submission inbox. And I won't actually take the time to pop into another browser and upload a paper as a student, but um, you have the ability as the instructor to submit papers on uh, for your students. So, you know, maybe a student emailed you a paper, they had trouble with the Turnitin assignment, you could submit the paper for them, or maybe you just had one student out of your class of 27 where you had some questions on their paper. You could create a Turnitin uh, assignment activity, hide it so the students don't see that it's there, uh, and don't feel like they have to submit something to it, but you can take that one questionable paper and upload it to um, to turn it in through your you know test land uh, paper and click add the submission and what Moodle will do, what this Turnitin activity in Moodle will do is it will ship that paper up to um, to Turnitin. Uh, you'll get a, a receipt on that. Um, when students submit their papers through the Turnitin interface, um, they'll get a receipt from Turnitin saying that their paper has been submitted. This uh, Submission inbox will show you all the papers that have been uploaded to Turnitin. It'll give you some basic information. They will give you an originality score here. Uh, it'll take a little while for that to be calculated and give you a link to go in to do, use the Grademark tools. So, um, Heath, just to jump in regarding Turnitin, just want to remind everyone um, to not import Turnitin yes. activities from previous semester's courses because those are tied to a specific bucket of students and the course space. So if you try to um, 
import a Turnitin activity from last semester into fall 2020, it would only, your students wouldn't be able to see it because your fall 2020 students were not the same students that were present in your spring course, so it just would not work for them. So all of these Turnitin activities do need to be recreated. So in the Turnitin's uh, feedback studio, uh, and, and we won't take time to go through this. You've got access to all of the uh, quiz mark, uh, quick mark tools uh, from Grademark, so that as you're reading through the paper and you want to, um, you know, do. Uh, You know, you know, we want to make a comment that the student really needs to check the evidence for a particular claim. You can just quickly drag that down, attach it to a particular part of the paper. You can add some additional comments about why you uh, put that comment on. It just kind of provides a, a quicker, easy way to use some regularly defined uh, feedback tools. If you um, go into the originality tools. You can see that um, you know since this was a, uh, uh, a paper I got off of the internet. Obviously, uh, a lot of the material is not my original content, and as an instructor, I can see that and uh, can you know get back in touch with the student to talk about what that means. Um, same thing with viewing these um, e-rater e feedback tools on the spelling and grammar and so forth. Um, you can determine whether you find that kind of feedback useful on the kinds of papers that you're having your students submit or not. Okay. So yeah, you can see that this paper shows up with a big red uh, similarity block indicating that you know, it's clearly one you as an instructor want to look at. Okay, so assignments, uh, the, the native Moodle assignment activity and Turnitin activity are two ways for you to collect work from your students. Um, just, we probably don't have to say a lot about the um, discussion forum activity uh, other than you know, in, in terms of online courses in particular, um, the forum activity in its ability to support uh, asynchronous ongoing conversations is uh, an important replacement for the kind of discussions that you would have in class. Um, and um, it's the forum activity here. Click add. There are a couple of other um, reasons why you might uh, want to use the forum activity. Uh, whenever I'm doing a remote or online class, I I just put a um, ask your course questions here discussion forum at the top of the Moodle course page, and really try to discourage students from emailing me directly uh, questions about the course. Because if they post the question about the course in the discussion forum in Moodle, I can answer it there and maybe not get six other additional emails that basically are asking the same question. Uh, example forum activity again. Um, we won't go through, we won't take the time to go through all the settings. This is really just kind of a high level overview. But one thing that is important here is for you to realize that Moodle actually has five different kinds of discussion forums that you can use. And the default is this standard forum for general use. This is the most general and generic uh, forum activity. It basically just creates a forum container in your course. Anyone, student or you in the course can start a new discussion thread. Anyone can reply to the discussion threads. Uh, this is the kind of forum that I would use for that ask your questions about the course here because I, I want students to be able to create new discussion questions or new, new discussion threads about questions or observations they have on the course. Uh, 
But this default standard form for general use is not the best instructional form. Because let's say you wanted to set up a forum for students to discuss some issues in the paper in the readings for that week. If you use a standard forum, uh, some students might reply to your initial post in the forum. Other students might start their own posts and then other students might go into those student started posts and post replies. And so the discussion gets very fragmented. I find that the single simple discussion and the Q&A forum are probably the two most important for instructional discussion forum activities. If you have a single, if you have a, an open-ended uh, discussion topic that you want just everyone to be able to come in when they come into the class, see what discussion has happened already and add their discussion to that, I would do a single simple discussion. Um, which is good for open-ended questions, but if your question is, you know, what's the melting point of tungsten, and you have a single simple discussion, the first student who looks it up in posts basically stops the discussion. You can also use a Q&A discussion forum type, in which case you create a forum activity, and you add one or more discussion threads to represent the questions that you want your students to discuss. Students can't add this can't add questions to a Q&A forum. Only you only you can add those question threads. Students have to go into say question number two. Uh, so Susan comes into the course. She goes into question number two. Uh, she sees what question you've posted there. She may see that four other students have already answered or, or, or have already contributed uh, uh, thoughts to that question, but she can't see what those, um, what those previous answers are until she posts her answer to question number two. So the Q&A forum gives uh, you a way to ask questions in the discussion forum to your students and um, and, and gives each of your students kind of a fresh take on the question where they can post their response before they can then get in and see what other students have said and, and do the typical kind of replying uh, to previous uh, posts that you would expect from a discussion forum. For the one example, I'm just going to do a single simple discussion here. You know, here is the discussion prompt. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about grading and ratings tomorrow when we're talking about uh, assessments. I click Save and Display. With the single simple discussion, there are no separate threads. The discussion is the only thread. You started off with your prompt, and then when students come in, they can reply to your initial prompt or if some other student has already replied to your initial prompt, the other students can reply to those replies to get kind of a threaded uh, conversation going around this open-ended discussion topic that, um, that you want to set up. Okay. So the forum activity, it's pretty fundamental, certainly to, to fully online courses. Um, uh, very important probably for your remote instruction courses. I have in the past really uh, tried to incorporate the online form activities for my face-to-face -face classes as well for a couple of reasons. Uh, many of you probably have the experience that when you try to do a uh, discussion in class, there may be a handful of students who really feel comfortable jumping in and contributing actively to the conversation in class. There are various ways, fishbowls, jigsaw, you know, small group discussion into a large group discussion, think, pair, share, other kinds of pedagogical approaches you can use to try to get more students um, contributing to in-class face-to-face discussions, but I have found that with my face-to-face -face classes, there are always students who are, maybe they're, in, they're somewhat um, introverted or um, 
uh, need some time to think about their answers before they're willing to you know commit I, I oftentimes find students kind of blossoming in the online discussions that I have for my face-to-face -face courses who are too reticent to contribute uh, in class you know there are obviously students who contribute actively both in class and online some students who kind of monopolize the conversation in class maybe not be active on the online forum so even with your face-to-face -face classes the the forum activity is a good complement uh, it gives students different opportunities to contribute to the class conversation uh, and certainly I mean we have we've done full hour-long workshops on um, on uh, using the forum activity for course discussions and uh, as a follow-up to the workshop I'll uh, send around links to those in the time remaining though Marie I think what I need to do is quickly go through some aspects of um, setting up quizzes and again we've got full workshops on this that will uh, that I'll send around a, a note um, let me just focus on what I think is the basic workflow that I use in working with Moodle quizzes I like to get my questions for the quiz into the question bank first um, before actually creating the quiz so the first step is how do you get your questions created how do you create the quiz activity that has all of the quiz settings that you want and then what do you need to do to add the questions from the question bank to that um, so if I come in here um, to my sandbox course in the course administration there are um, there's this whole section under question bank there is a section for writing questions there's a section for creating categories you can import and export questions I like to in general keep my question bank fairly organized by the use of categories so for our demonstration this afternoon I'm going to go into course administration and under the question bank select categories and you can see that I've already created some different categories I'm going to create a new category that I'm going to call what is life because that's the topic I want to write the question the, the quiz about I'm going to add that category and for this quiz I'm just going to do some multiple choice questions to make sure that the students are reading through the materials um, we'll look briefly at your options for writing questions in Moodle but many of us already have um quizzes that we might have say in a word document where we've got a whole series of multiple choice questions you know here's question number one here are the answers typically when i'm running off um you know this quiz for my students i won't tell them what the answer is but if you already have um quizzes or tests written that are primarily multiple choice questions uh, you can modify them to let Moodle know what the correct answer is save that file as a text document and then in Moodle you can just directly import those questions and it's a much faster process to do that using the Aiken format import you see all of these different formats that you can you can import questions into Moodle um, Aiken format gives you this is a simple format for for importing multiple choice questions from a text file if you click on more help it will tell you that basically you just have to write what's your question what are the possible answers what is the correct answer space space what's the next question what are the possible answers what's the correct answer and so forth so again this is a very um, 
useful way to get multiple choice questions in. I want to um, import all of these questions from my what is life text file into the what is life category. Um, I can just drag and drop that text file onto the file upload area and I click import and Moodle is going to tell me okay it's parsing all the questions it found 14 questions it's listed these 14 questions if I click continue then I will see that in my what is life category I now have 14 multiple choice questions you can tell they're multiple choice questions because they've got this little multiple choice question symbol here. If I wanted to uh, edit a question to um, to clean it up, I could edit it, I could delete it, I can preview, see what the question is going to look like in Moodle. Moodle is going to present the, the multiple choice question in this format. Here's the uh, here's the question. It has randomly presented the five possible orders, uh, five possible answers. Um, if I'm previewing this as faculty member, I can click fill in the correct response and see that, you know, this is the uh, correct answer that I had selected. Close the preview. Okay. So that's, that's importing. There are some other import formats if you uh, wanted to import multiple choice, uh, matching, true, false, fill in the blank questions. You could do that um, with the um, gift format. So again, this is a way, if you don't want to write your questions in Moodle, but you prefer to actually just kind of write them in Word because you can write questions faster in Word, as long as you're willing to learn a little bit of a markup language to use. This GIF format um, directions will show you what, um, you know, so here's what a multiple choice question looks like. Here's what a fill in the blank question looks like. Here's what a matching question looks like. Um, so file, importing your questions is one way to get them in. If you actually go um, and select the questions option under the question bank, you can see that, um, you know, depending on what category you're working in, you click create a new question. There are all these different kinds of questions that you can actually write in Moodle. If you're doing a music theory class, you can select a music theory question and do all sorts of you know, identify this random scale or other kinds of things. You can do numeric questions. You can add essay questions. You would have to obviously grade the essay questions. Moodle can't grade them for you. You can do a calculated multiple choice question. You can do a drag and drop onto text. So all these different kinds of questions, you can do short answer, true, false. Um, you can add to your question bank uh, if you're wanting to actually create your questions in Moodle. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go through those other than to point out that, that that's there. So step one, um, create your questions, get them into the question bank, uh, organize them into categories. If you're, if you're compulsive like I am, you, know, you use categories to organize things. Um, step two is uh, adding an actual quiz activity. So I will just select uh, the quiz activity from uh, the activity chooser. I'll say example quiz. In the description, the description is not required, but here you could remind you could remind students. You remember this is over chapter uh, thirteen and fourteen. Um, you can, uh, let me just expand all of the settings here just to point out what you're going to want to keep in mind. Uh, you're probably going to want to open the quiz at a particular time and close the quiz at some time. Um, so, 
you know, let's say the quiz is going to open on tomorrow at um, 3 p.m. And it's going to close at 4 p.m. So you're giving students an hour window to get in. But this quiz is only going to be 10 multiple choice questions. I really don't want to give them an hour. Um, maybe I think, you know, it's reasonable for them to be able to answer 10 multiple choice questions in 15 minutes. I mean, I, I do a lot of 10 question multiple choice question, uh, quizzes in Moodle for kind of reading readiness questions uh, or, or activities. And if you look at the, you know, the time um, that students take for uh, on on average, you know, most of my students are taking four or five minutes to do a 10 question multiple choice question. Um, if they don't finish the quiz in 15 minutes or they forget to hit submit, the default is that open attempts are automatically submitted so that you don't have a student who you know, starts a quiz, forgets to submit it, and then can't submit because they didn't actually hit the submit button before the 15 minutes were, were up. Uh, the default, because Moodle is very focused on student learning and not necessarily on grading, is to allow students to come back and do the quiz as many times as they want. You can obviously make that, you know, you get one choice. Or maybe, uh, like with my reading response quizzes, I typically will give students five chances. I'll show in a minute that they're going to get different questions each time. This just gives them more time on task. Um, you can determine whether you want all the, you if you want all the questions to show up on one page or if you want a new page for every question. The default that we've set for our Moodle system is, you know, 10 questions per page. You can make that 20 if you want, you know, whatever you think is reasonable. The default is for multiple choice answers to be shuffled within the questions. If you are going to allow students to take um, the quiz more than one time, you will want to uh, suppress what the right answer is on any given question until the quiz is closed. But it's a good idea to tell, let them know, okay, you got eight points out of 10, you got these questions right, you got these two questions wrong. I'm not gonna tell you what the right answer is, but you can you know, see what wrong answers you, what, what questions you answered incorrectly. Um, click, you know, all these other things you really don't need to worry too much about. Click save and display. You now have questions in the question bank. You now have a quiz activity that is empty, doesn't have any questions in it. Moodle will tell you that there are no questions. If you click edit quiz, uh, you need to add quiz questions. And you could actually write your questions <clears throat> right in the, in the quiz activity. I, I don't recommend that, but uh, I've, I've uploaded like 14 questions to that uh, category and I want uh, Moodle to do a random selection of eight of those questions every time a student does one of the quiz attempts. I can go to that what is life category and I can select eight random questions, click add, and um, these are not you know, specified questions. Every time a student launches this quiz, they're going to get a random set of eight questions out of those 14. If you did want, if you did want one of the questions to show up every time, you could actually select it from um, the list of questions in your category and it would be there as a defined question. Just realize that one of these random questions might also be that same one. So you might not want to have this in the same category that you're drawing the random questions from. So now if I'm looking at the quiz activity, I've got, uh, I've got the questions, I've got the activity, I've added the questions to the activity, 
If I go into administration under quiz administration, I can preview the quiz and it's tell students will see that this is a timed quiz. They click start attempt and then this is what it would look like. And again, this is just a multiple choice quiz. If there were essay questions or true false questions, they would display as essay or true false questions. So that's really kind of blasting through these core activities. Keith, before leaving um, quiz, can you just show how um, if a student has documented a uh, need for additional yes. time? Thanks. Okay. So um, you oftentimes get an over, um, um, a recommendation or not a, rec um, a requirement that students need time and a half. And well, I'm going to say double time because I set set up this quiz as 15 minutes. If I go to user overrides, I can click add a user override and I can find the user. I'm going to give test lambda an override here. And then you basically select the user and then any of these uh, aspects of the quiz. So maybe you need to allow test lambda to take the quiz on a different day or maybe you need to give test lambda 30 minutes on the quiz rather than um, um, rather than 15. Uh, you set whatever variance you need to provide that student and click save and then uh, Moodle will list for you all of the individual user overrides that you have provided to the different students in your course. And just to jump in on this point, this has to be done for each quiz. So it doesn't yeah. carry over from quiz to quiz. So if you have five quizzes and several students who do need additional time, you'll need to designate that for each of those five quizzes. Yeah. And some students might need double time, might be uh, have an accommodation of twice times a, a double time, other students might have 50% extra. So this individual user ride, individual user override gives you the ability to customize those overrides to the extent that you need. Uh, we'll talk about some of the quiz reports uh, next time when we're talking about more assessment stuff. We'll talk about uh, grading discussion forums next time. We'll talk about rubrics in both the Moodle assignments and the Turnitin uh, assignments. And we'll, we'll talk about how you can get that all organized in your gradebook. But again, don't forget these other learning activities. But um, clearly collecting assignments, holding discussions, doing testing are really the kind of the three core areas of learning activities that um, you see in pretty much every online or remote um, instruction course. And with that, we're already five minutes over. Um, I don't know, Marie, if there's anything else in the chat um, that I need to address. Uh, I'm sure you've been getting back to people as they have posted. Yeah, things. I think we've covered um, yeah. pretty much every. There's a question about open book quizzes. Um, I don't know if you want to even start, you know, just mention lockdown browsers yeah. things that are available. Well, I mean, we, we do have we do have Respondus tools, both lockdown browser and monitor available. If we, if you want to do a high stakes Moodle quiz at i.e. test uh, in a proctored kind of environment. But, uh, and maybe one thing we'll talk about next time when we're talking about uh, authentic assessments is ways to rethink, you know, maybe what I did for my final exam in the course was a multiple choice exam, but maybe there's uh, other authentic assessments that would make more sense for a remote instruction class or maybe I don't bother with the lockdown browser tools but just write my my final exam in Moodle in a way that I just realize that you know I'm treating this as an open book exam I'm focusing my questions on more cognitive processes and less on you know individual content recall 
and I'm more interested in uh, can students demonstrate the ability to think through and analyze the questions, then maybe it's less important for me to you know use a tool like Lockdown Browser. But we can we can deal with some of those uh, topics when we talk about assessment strategies um, uh, tomorrow. Uh, again, we'll uh, follow. We'll we'll post the recording to this workshop if you want to you know go back and look at some of the examples for e these individual uh, activities. I'll post. I'll send around the link to that. Um, to the RSVP list for the workshop, along with um, you know some of the links that Marie has in here to different activity uh, help materials and and highlighting back into the Moodle Foundation certificate. Uh, like I say, we save the chat automatically on these sessions. I'll go through the chat overnight tonight to see if there are other things that. Uh, we'll need to send back out to the to all of you who showed up do take a couple minutes to uh, you know reply back into the chat again um any any further questions or also um you know what activities you're most interested in using for your course designs for the fall that way you know we've got um uh, we, I'll, I'll be sure to know um you know by by your posting in the chat you know who was here so that we can follow up specifically with any of these topics okay so uh a little bit later today because of the later start um and going trying to go through these four activities but uh again if you have any questions on getting any of these set up and uh you need uh, to to get in touch with us, just email tltc at purchase.edu. Marie's probably already put that into the chat. And um, that will come to both of us. Marie will probably get back to you more quickly, given how crazy uh, uh, my life is. But, uh, uh, you know, she can really help you uh, pretty much get any of these um, these activities up and running in your courses. Okay. And with that, I will stop sharing and stop the recording.